this is uh, York. Um, it hasn't really changed in about 2,000 years. Well, it's changed a bit. So 2,000 years ago, that wasn't there. That's only about 800 years old. That's our cathedral, which is rather nice. Uh, that's the castle that's about 1,000 years old. Um, and you cannot see the walls, but there are city walls. And there are parts of the walls you can still see which date back to the Roman period. So York became famous almost 2,000 years ago when one of the Roman emperors came and he made this his base. And in fact, Rome, York was the center of the Roman Empire for a short period when the emperor lived there. So York became the capital of the north <coughs> for the Romans. And then later on, the Vikings came. They came from Scandinavia and they also made uh, York a center. And there are many other famous stories. Um, some of you may have... Um, heard about, we had a very famous king in Britain called Henry VIII, famous because he had many wives, he had six wives, and he killed some of them because he didn't like them. Well, Henry actually, uh, Henry spent time in York, and part of the University of York is in fact where Henry came and stayed. In fact, the story is, one occasion he came to that stay in the house, which is now part of the university, when he was waiting for one of his wives to come down from Scotland. There is a road in York which points due north, which goes directly in the direction of Scotland. So people would wait there for carriages and things to come, uh, in this case, with his future wife. It's a beautiful city, only a population of about 150,000. Uh, so maybe a little bit uh, less than Sao Carlos, but you know, small and perfectly formed. You should come and visit. So some of the universities inside the city, most of the universities outside the city on a campus, where universities normally should be, like here. And this is the University of York, the main campus. It's built around a very large lake. This is a false lake. It's actually built inside a big plastic bag. We were talking about plastic bags before. I think this must be one of the world's biggest plastic bags. And they basically created a lake. And there's also, there's no, you can't see any birds there, but normally it's full of ducks and geese and swans. It's a very, very nice environment. And this is the university around. And inside the trees, we have the Green Chemistry Center. We don't live in trees. Maybe we should, but we don't. But, um, you know, Vanya's office is up, up in a tree house. Yeah, so it's, uh, you know, really, really genuinely green. And we have another campus now, which is an extension, which doubles the size of the whole campus. And again, that's, uh, that's a campus space. So in the Green Chemistry Center, we are doing research, of course, working with industry, of course. We do a lot of education. We do a lot of networking. We are in a beautiful new building, which I should get some better pictures of. This is the outside picture of our new building. We have a scale-up lab, which has got big things like a big microwave, I said before. This is the original big microwave, which is also about the size of this table. This is some of the research team. There are some Brazilians there hiding in there. This is from a little bit, of, this is last year, I think, when we had some science with our border students. We hope to get some more next year. Lots of Chinese students as well. In total, about 21 different countries in the group at the moment, of up to about 80 to 100 people. We have a lot of activities. We have a network, which is about food waste, of course, which includes this university. So this was the first Brazilian university to join the network on food waste. We have, as you can see, over 200 partners across Europe, and now a few partners from outside of Europe, especially here. We have a master's program in green chemistry, which is very popular, and has about 20 students every year from many different countries. And they come, as you can see, from all sorts of places. Here's a group of them doing one of our outreach activities from various places. So, you know, she's just finishing her PhD now as well, actually. Um, so she is now working for us, helping to run the networks. I saw him in India last year. He's now working in India, doing voluntary work with, the, um, with one of the NGOs in India. So, you know, the people come to us, they do some studies, they go back often to their home country and do something important, you know. We want them to go back and practice what they learn. Here's our mascot, a frog, of course. Of course, he's green, you know, so he has to be. So, uh, and inside the frog costume there is a, is a lady called Jenny. And Jenny has just come back from spending two years in Brazil. So Jenny has come over to Brazil, spent two years, learned Portuguese much better than me. And she is now, she was the only person brave enough to wear the frog outfit. But she's still very keen and still wants to do lots of outreach. So he's our mascot, and he helps us to uh, get information across, of course, to, to, many, to, many, uh, to many people, uh, especially younger people and to the general public. So we never stop. You know, green chemistry never sleeps. We have to always think of new things. So for example, locally, we have something called BioVail, 
which is where we are trying to get companies to come with us on this great, exciting journey, the future bio-based products, people with resources, people who need new products, people with new technologies coming together to work together in the region to really help the future of the bio-based economy. And the other initiative is the opposite, is international. And we call it G2C2, a global network of green chemistry centers. And I mentioned this in particular because once again, Vanya was there, you know, and you can see, I think, hopefully just about appearing on there if they've got it right. So yeah, we have it, we have it there. So this is a map which is showing this, this, this network only started less than one year ago. And already we have people, members from North America, Latin America, Africa, all around Asia and Europe. And since, and just in the last month, um, the new Green Chemistry Center in Amsterdam, University of Amsterdam, and as of next month, the new Green Chemistry Center in the west of France will also become members as well. It's growing all the time. And it's important because it, it shows that, you know, green chemistry is global. Everywhere you go in the world, there are interesting resources. There are problems with waste. There are opportunities to turn that waste into a resource and build up new chemical manufacturing, new chemical products, which are genuinely green and sustainable. But Brazil very much is at the heart of this. Remember that. You really are in a very powerful position to do and to demonstrate to others what can be done in moving towards a future biorefinery-based economy. Thank you very much. Uh, I've got a question. Sure. What's the long uh, Pois é, eu vou usar em inglês. É? Tá. O curso você vai dobrar? I'm doing master, yeah. master in chemistry. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you have shown that we can get chemicals from waste food, for example, orange peels. And um, I was thinking, how about the energy that is spent to get to turn uh, those uh, waste food into those chemicals which we are sure. want, yes. we want? Because may, I was thinking maybe it's not entirely applied now because of the energy spent to get to get those chemicals from those waste food, and maybe the polit politician behind. Uh, politicians always, yes, uh, always behind it, yes. Um, yes, you have to be very careful about the energy. So, for example, with the microwave technology, microwaves use electricity, okay? They actually, the microwave process is very, very energy efficient. But you have to be careful how you make the electricity. So, compare with the prison, get those chemicals from a, a normal refinery. Is it higher from that? From it varies. I mean, you, I mean there's, no, there's no single answer to all that because it depends on the process, it depends on the... I mean, I would say that, I mean, there are some technologies you have to be careful about. I mentioned supercritical fluids. They are very energy demanding. So they only work, I would say, when you have a very large volume and when you are close to a source of cheap electricity. So, for example, by a power station. Yeah? So if you have a power station where the electricity, of course, is relatively cheap and efficient, then that's a good place to have high energy technologies. Obviously, in some cases, that's not appropriate. So it varies. What, all I say is you have to, when you do the calculations, and we do a lot of calculations, you have to look at the energy. You have to look at the water. You have to look at everything, you know, because that's the future when we look at everything really, really carefully. We have made some mistakes in the past, thinking we were going in a green direction. Some of the biofuel work has not been so good. You know, some biodiesel was made from food. Grade, you know, that's not good enough, you know? So people have learned and said, no, we need to be much more careful now. And energy, of course, is a big, big part of this. Yeah, I agree, it's a good point. So there's a microwave in a uh, way to get those chemicals by now? Well, we think it's very good. I mean, the, the, the downside with microwave is you have to, you have to buy a microwave, <laughs> you know? So, uh, and I don't mean a kitchen microwave. So you have to buy a big microwave. So, I mean, I've seen, I know a company who, um, they work with a, a microwave, which is a process of six tons per hour. Okay, a biomass. So it's about the size of this room. Uh, and that costs about one and a half million euros. So you have to buy something, you know? Uh, so there is a big capital investment cost for microwaves. Um, so it's, it's not appropriate. If you're a small guy, you know, doing something little, it's probably not suitable for you. Bigger companies, yes. Companies working together, yes.
I think it's got real possibilities and it's becoming more and more popular. It's one of, one of the technologies available. I think it's a very interesting one, but there are other technologies as well that we should consider, of course. Professor, I'm Daniel Bruno, and I'm doing PT here. Uh, you were talking about pyrolysis of raw biomass, typically like starborn, and uh, I've been working with sugarcane, bagasse burning, uh -huh. and when you do the uncontrolled burning, you can have lots of extremely toxic chemicals like tyrosine, purines. Absolutely. So, do you work with that? Do you, how do you cope with that? You can do something to, for instance, uh, capture dyes and at the same time really yeah, I mean, it depends on the processor. So for example, with a microwave process, it's all collected, contained, and separated, so we don't have any releases. The star buns you mentioned, we actually heat them in a very controlled atmosphere or in a vacuum. So, in fact, there is, uh, we don't detect any, any really dangerous volatiles, but we are doing it in a very controlled way. You know, it's really important. And as you say, if you, if you lose control, then, you know, it's, it's dangerous um, and it's very inefficient as well. I think pyrolysis has got a bad reputation because so much of it has been really high temperature and not so well controlled and it's, you know, uh, I, I'm really, I mean, when we say pyrolysis, okay, for the star bombs at high temperatures, it probably is pyrolysis. For the microwave work, it, probably the better word is torrefaction because we are working normally below 200 degrees. So it's not really pyrolysis. Usually, um, I bring solvent. Uh, uh, I don't remember any... Styrene, yeah. Yes. That one you had a kit out from some. Uh-huh. Uh, is that stable? Surprisingly, not? yes. We didn't know. When we first were thinking of it, because we it was a classic example of paper chemistry. So we looked at the molecule levoglucosinone. So this company said, hey, we can make levoglucosinone from waste cellulose of the highest known yield. I can't remember now, 15, 20%, something like that, which is makes, we think it makes it cost effective and we're scaling up. So we'll have a lot of lever glucosinone. And I'm looking at the structure and thinking, okay, well, okay, let's try hydrogenating it because let's get rid of that double bond. That could make it interesting. And we did some kind of calculations that suggested it might be an interesting solvent. So we made it and we tested, we've done a lot of tests and we were surprised. It's amazing, you can distill it. It really is surprisingly stable. Now, we are now looking at ways to use that as an intermediate to make other molecules um, because, yeah, you know, I mean, we need a whole range of solvent properties. But no, siren is absolutely fine. I mean, it's, we've had no problem at all. It does form a hydrate with water. So you can, I mean, the diol's reversible. If you do form the diol, it reverses back again. So it doesn't seem to be a particular problem in, in the applications we've used, or as I said, in separation, purification, it seems, it seems fine. So I think we're lucky. <laughs> I don't really understand fully why. And I've been talking to organic chemists as well, and they are not, not completely sure, but hey, it works, so it's... Uh...